I want to thank everybody for joining us. This is what I like to call a good faith space where we have uh, good faith conversations with uh, people from different backgrounds um, who I kind of handpick because I'm curious to hear what they think about a variety of topics. So uh, obviously you see the topic for today is, is college important anymore? Um, so before I get into it, I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we can start with Jake. Jake, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here and meet everybody. Um, my name is Jake Coco. I'm a musician. Um, did not go to college myself, uh, but not necessarily opposed to college by any means. But I am here to kind of discuss the perspective of just diving right into your into your trade or into your passion, whatever that may be. And uh, looking forward to chatting, chatting with you guys. All right, thank you. We'll go to Sheena. Sheena, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. So I'm Sheena Mason. I'm an assistant professor at a school in New York, and I'm also the president and co-founder of an educational consulting business called Theory of Racistness. Um, I like to think my my ideas on this topic are new, nuanced, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how this goes. I'm just happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for coming on. Um, and Eric, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Eric Smith, the Associate Professor of Rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania um, and a co-founder of Free Black Thought and Empowered Pathways, which is a you know a, an attempt at providing an alternative to contemporary diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, among other things. Um, I've actually published on this topic, so blessing and curse. Uh, I have a lot to say, um, and I hope I don't talk too much. In fact, if I am talking too much, feel free to say, Eric, shut up. I won't be offended. <laughs> no, probably won't do that. Um, you know, I have you guys on here for a reason, so I'm very interested and hear what you guys think. I'll, I'll introduce myself for people who aren't familiar with me. My name is Adam Coleman. Um, I am the author of a book called Black Victim to Black Victor, uh, available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. Um, I'm also the founder of Wrong Sweet Publishing, which is basically an outlet for, to uh, express yourself openly and freely um, with thoughtful and thought-provoking articles. Uh, so if you're ever interested in publishing, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can go to wrongspeak.net. Um, so I will open up by giving a little bit of my, my viewpoint on this. So full disclosure, I did not go to college. I went to trade school, I went to tech school. Um, and so part of the reason I didn't go to college is because I didn't feel confident enough to go to college. Um, my sister went to college, she did her own thing. But for myself, I felt like trade school was a, a good in-between. Uh, it took a long time to get my IT career started, but I'm glad I didn't go to college because I think I would have incurred a lot of debt and been lost in the shuffle of college and trying to figure out what I wanted to be, especially in a time in my life where I kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, so that's my perspective, you know, or I, I'm sorry, that's my situation. Um, as far as how I view college, or to kind of answer the question, is college important anymore? Uh, it depends. Um, it's kind of like the half answer, but I think it depends on what you're going to school for. Um, if you're going to just go, I don't think it's important to just get a college degree just to say you have one because I've met and worked with people who are uh, secretaries and they're using that psychology degree to basically uh, fit in their room, uh, but not using it towards their career um, because they don't know what they want to do with themselves and they just kind of went just to go. Um, but then if there are certain professions that you, you need it, it sounds like you probably have a good direction to go towards. You probably need to go to college for it. Um, so I think the answer is it depends. Um, that's just my short answer. We'll get more into it. 
So I will start with actually, Eric, you said you have a lot to say about this topic. So let's hear your, your perspective. Okay, well, as a professor, I'm a little biased. So let's just start with that. Um, but Perfect. when I think of this <laughs> idea, you know, when I think of the efficacy of college, I think of this report from the Teagle Foundation, a white paper I read years ago, and I actually used it as a framework for an article. It had basically four different takes on college, uh, four different um, ideological formats, if you will. Um, one of them is um, values and dispositions. And basically what that means is uh, what Anthony Apaya um, called soul making. You know, you're going to graduate, you're going to be a certain kind of person with certain kinds of values, a certain kind of disposition. You know, um, you are digging into uh, the college's preferred discourse. And and when I say discourse, I um, I go by a social linguist named James G who called, uh, who called discourse, let me see, I got it written down here. Um, a ways of being in the world or forms of life which integrate words, acts, values, beliefs, attitudes, social identities, as well as gestures, glances, body position, and clothes. All right. So it's really like the making the ideal person in society. Right. Um, the second one is liberal education as content. Right. We, um, you know, you, we read certain books and then we after we read them and understand them, we are upstanding citizens of society. Right. It's um, what Alan Bloom called cultural literacy. It's also a great way to hold forth at a cocktail party. Right. You know. Uh, all kinds of books, uh, all the classics, and it's a sign that you are an educated uh, human being. Um, liberal arts or liberal education as outcomes um, is more my speed. Um, it's basically about looking at every discipline as a lens through which to see the world, right? So when you graduate, you'll know how to use the scientific method. You'll, you'll know how to you know, think uh, philosophically, uh, critically, right? Um, all these things you take, um, all these classes you take in various disciplines are to give you various outlooks, right? And um, no, that was um, liberal education as modes of inquiry. Liberal education as outcomes is basically um, at the end of your college career, you will know or you will be skilled at these things, right? Uh, critical thinking, scientific method, um, self-reflection, uh, what have you. Um, the issue, I think, today is that liberal education as values and disposition is being challenged, um, not because it's a bad idea, but because the values and dispositions aren't the ones people want, right? Um, we hear often that the values and dispositions, uh, you know, promoted at the college level are inherently Eurocentric and therefore inherently racist to a large degree and to expect a person of color to abide by these values and dispositions is a problem, right? Um, what's more, the liberal education as content kind of does the same thing, right? You have to read these certain books and once you read these certain books, you will have the mindset you're supposed to have. Well, who decides what books those are, right? Um, you know, where you go to college might depend on what they consider the primary great books. So those are the two problematic uh, forms of uh, college education that I think are the issue right now. The other two are, you know, I abide by them. Um, your college where I teach abides by them. Um, so I think those are less contentious. So is college important anymore? Well, it depends on what you want, as Adam just said. Are you okay with a values and disposition kind of thing? Are you okay with a content kind of thing? Um, you can look into this by uh, looking at manuals like the um, the Fisk manual for um, you know understanding colleges. That's always a good one. And the other ones that I think of are either not that great, they're biased, or they're no longer in publication. So, I mean, looking at that before you go to college would be a good idea. Uh, just to make sure that you're entering into a place where the values and dispositions are something that you like, right? I went to college because I had my own values and dispositions and I wanted to enhance them. I didn't want to be made into somebody, 
right? Um, so I went to a school that was, you know, kind of like that, but kind of not. I don't know. I don't regret it. The parties were great, so I don't regret it. But but those are the um, ideas that you should think about when you're going to college. And if none of those appeal to you, maybe college isn't for you. So I'll stop there. Okay. I mean, that's that's a lot to take in. We can definitely come back to. Uh, let's go to Dr. Sheena. Um, yeah, so I agree with much of what has been said, um, a little bit about me. So I had the very good fortune of being exposed to really any book I could have wanted, could have wanted as a child. And I read voraciously and I read to escape the severe abuse and neglect that I was experiencing at home. I thought, of course, that... Um, I could earn my parents' affection by being a perfect student. So school was a safe haven for me. And I put a lot of value on school largely because of those experiences. Um, When I turned 16, on my 16th birthday, I actually moved out of that household and chose homelessness over staying there, which resulted in my dropping out of high school my senior year. And I was an honors student. I was taking AP courses. I was taking college economics and college English and should have been the best year of my life. But I had what I call bigger fish to fry. So I dropped out. And naturally, you know, the social worker at the school and a couple of my teachers were concerned that I would become a statistic, right? Because the statistics for um, high school dropouts is, is such that I had a higher chance of not returning and not finishing, but I knew I would finish. It was just a matter of when, and sure enough, the next year I finished high school, um, graduated, you know, at the top of the class, I went to undergrad, graduated at the top of the class, was a student commencement speaker actually. And what got me through my undergraduate education was the sincere belief in the transformative power of education. Why? Because I had lived it. You know, I lived the experience of having nothing and having no one and um, experiencing and living a lot of violence at, in, at my home. And my turning to education is what showed me that there was so much more to the world than what I was experiencing and what I had seen. And I took that, that belief in the transformative power of education and I've taken it with me er ever since, right? Like now I have a doctorate, (laughs) namely because I believe sincerely in the transformative power of education. I think if we focus on education as primarily a way to make a certain, you know, income bracket or um, think, get a specific profession or things of that nature, I think, I think that that's one way to approach, you know, is college important or is it should everyone go to college or something like that? I feel like those are all very subjective um those are subjective answers that any one of us could ultimately come up with. As Eric said, he started out saying he's biased because he's a professor. Similarly, I'm biased because of my childhood experiences and the, the experiences I have also as a professor and just believing in the power of education. And I tend to lean into the idea that education has the benefit of creating better citizens um, better thinkers, right? Those kinds of, of, of qualities that come out of education, which I prioritize over anything else. Uh, but I also don't discount or devalue the, the fact that other people have other paths, right? I I don't think there's, and I also think that because of the proliferation of, access, easier access to knowledge, specific types of knowledge and things like that. I think that also makes this conversation more complicated than it was even just 10 years ago or, or, you know, something like that, because ultimately, um, ultimately to gain certain types of knowledge and even to build critical thinking skills and, and all of that, I think there are other 
untraditional ways to do that too. There have always been, but I think that's even more true now. So I don't make the case that everyone should go to college, but I do think the people who do go to college greatly benefit from going to college. Okay. All right. And uh, Jake. Yeah. So um, I think we're all in a pretty, pretty agreeable space. I totally um, have see a lot of value in college and I, by no means I'm coming from the angle of saying that no one should go to college or anything like that. I know that is a, a point that some people kind of stand on, but that's, that's not where I'm at. Um, a little bit about my history. I, I'm in the music world. So coming out of high school, I was in a band and we toured and we we're doing great. And then uh, all of a sudden when I was 20, we broke up and I just didn't really know where to go. So I headed out to Los Angeles as a lot of lost folks do. Um, entered the workforce out there, just kind of waiting tables and doing stuff. And then, um, also experienced homelessness for about a year and a half um, when I decided to dive fully into music. So I was living in my car, kind of sleeping on the beach, um, and through grace of God, was fortunate enough to start um, having some success in the music industry. Um, started my company, which is called Keep Your Soul Records. Uh, it's an independent record label. Um, started it while couch surfing on futons and uh, just kind of learned business from the ground up. Um, and was really fortunate to have it work out. Uh, I don't think that's like a path that anyone should try, try to follow by any means or, or nor was it enjoyable. Um, I definitely see areas of opportunity in my own past and in, in some of my peers past who didn't go to college where we could have learned valuable lessons through the collegiate experience or, uh, just through, you know, basic education that we lacked by not going to college. Um, but I also think that there is a certain level of uh, creativity, uh, creative freedom that I was afforded by, by not kind of diving into um, what Eric so proficiently worded as, as I wrote down, but I lost my note here. But um, anyway, the main takeaway that I have uh, from my own experience is that I think I could have benefited from uh, some aspects of college, but when everything's said and done, I'm grateful to be alive in a time where knowledge is no longer gate kept. And I, I have been fortunate to be able to access a lot of uh, lessons and stuff from great professors um, actually on the internet and stuff like that. So while we may not be able, you know, I mean, some somebody that actually went to school, I was able to get some parts of the college experience, um, obviously on the social side, just through, through participating in parties and stuff like that. And, you know, seeing my friends at college, but also on the, on the educational side, um, you know, that information is no longer, kind of held under lock and key, you can still kind of access it uh, if you have an autodidactical nature um, or even just the general curiosity towards stuff. That's a pretty cool time to be alive and, and have access to so much information. Okay. Um, Eric, I, I guess you might be the only person on this panel that wasn't homeless at some point in their life. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming, unless you got a story that we don't know about. Uh, no, I've, uh, I've had a home, well, quote unquote home, uh, most of my life. So, yeah. Oh, damn. All right. Well, um, <laughs> it was just an observation that I noticed, um, because not to like change the topic, but I always appreciate when people like myself and, and, uh, you know, and Jake and Gina come from a situation of homelessness, which is, you know, it's extremely difficult to go through. I've been homeless three times in my life. Um, the, the third time as an adult uh, for a very short period of time. And thankfully people helped me, but I always use those moments to kind of say like, I was able to overcome that and I was able to build up from that. So uh, it's always nice. Well, nice might be the real word, but it's always interesting to hear from uh, other people who experienced the same type of situation and was able to accomplish great things with their life, uh, even though they had to experience that. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. It was just an observation. Um, I kind of want to switch a little bit because, you know, the title is, is college important anymore? Obviously, I think college has value. I pretty much agree with what everybody is saying. I think it just really depends what you're, what you're doing where you're going for. But I think for me, especially as a father, my son is 16 years old, but I remember when he became a teenager, I started thinking about the prospect of college for him. 
And, you know, he's an intelligent kid. He obviously wants to get um, uh, more education, uh, higher education. But the thing that I was always concerned with was cost. And it makes me switch the question to, is college worth it from a value standpoint? Because I, I often think to myself, is it worth it for an 18 year old kid to leave high school, go to college, sign uh, paperwork for a student loan for 60, 80, sometimes near $100,000 for a four year degree, what, which they're halfway sure that they want to get. Um, they have no idea what that profession is like. It's a complete mystery. We don't really utilize apprenticeships before college in America like in other countries do. Um, I, I've met some Europeans who utilize apprenticeships before they go to college. So they have an idea as to, is this the right profession? Um, and I think to myself, do I really want that for my son to basically come out with such a large amount of debt? Um, and, and, and just like anybody else, whether you go to college or not, you got to start from the bottom. Um, so you're not coming out with a, a cushy 60, 70, or a $100,000 job, you gotta, you gotta work hard for that. It's gonna take you years. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a financial burden. So, you know, even for myself, I know that if I had gone to college for uh, computer science, instead of going to a, uh, a technical school, I, I would have a much, a much more well-rounded education around technology, for sure. Um, however, I know that I've done the same exact job as people who, um, who did go to college. I've worked alongside them and I've done the job equally as good, to, equally as good as them or more. So the only difference is that it didn't cost me nearly as much to go and get that, uh, that technical school education versus the four year degree that they were able to get. So in life, there are always trade-offs and I do see that there is value with sitting in front of great professors who could teach you a lot of lessons, um, you know, like the professors we have in, these, in this panel. Um, but it's the, it's the price. It's the price of it. Is the price there? Is there value there? You know, is it really worth it to have that much debt? Um, is it fair to have that much debt? Um, you know, so I, I wonder that particular piece to the college experience because it's a very important piece. Um, so this is open to the floor. Anybody can jump in. Well, can I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there is this form, there's this pedagogy uh, that is, I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's definitely up and coming now called problem-based learning. And what problem-based learning is supposed to be is quote unquote ill-structured, meaning that you know the students are in groups, they're dealing with real life situations, there's a real life stakeholder who needs a real life solution. And they are pretty much left on their own, you know, to figure out the best way to solve this problem. Right. Um, so the way I do it, I I lecture or you know, lead discussions and things like that for the first half of the semester. And the second half of the semester, they do problem-based learning where they're teaching themselves. So, I mean, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with this because I like to walk around and, and actually teach. I'm a professor, you know, as opposed to uh, guide and things like that, which is what's necessary for problem-based learning. But it, I, I see the efficacy of it. And problem-based learning is something that students in vocational technical high schools are already doing, and they're doing it well. York PA has a great vocational and technical school. You know, there are kids coming out of high school making a salary it took me 20 years to make, right? And, and they don't have student loans. So, I mean, if you're just trying to be financially secure and, you know, have a happy life and things like that, college isn't necessary. You can jump into things, you know, uh, straight out of high school if you, you know, uh, have an education that was conducive to that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I guess all of this is to say that college is great, but it's not as necessary as people think it is um, for 
success in life. I'm done. I can speak a bit to like the the concept of apprenticeships because that's something that I really I really agree about the importance of apprenticeships and in, in the music industry it's something that uh, exists well and I mean I'm sure in many industries but I can only speak to music specifically but we in recording studios you typically have what's called a runner which is traditionally someone who just runs and gets coffee when you're in a studio you're paying you know whatever thousand dollars two thousand dollars for the day as an artist so you don't want to take 15 minutes to go run to Starbucks or get some lunch or whatever. So sort of the entry level position that exists in that environment is the runner, which a lot of uh, people who want to be producers or musicians kind of have this mentality that they scoff towards, but I've, I've just always been a go getter in the, in that sp- I, I'm happy to go get coffee. I just like getting coffee in general. I mean, it's not even about <laughs> the apprenticeship. I just like coffee. So um, having the mindset of just being willing to be an apprentice and understanding what that role is and how to insert yourself there and uh, not just be there, but how to actually gain value from being sort of the, the lower rung on the totem pole um, is something that I think is lost in a lot of uh, people today, a lot of kids today and stuff. Um, and I, I think that we need to bring that aspect of learning back, whether it's through the collegiate experience or just uh, through traditionally entering the workforce no matter what your skill set is or what your job ends up being, having that ability to uh, humble yourself and put yourself into a position where you can learn from somebody who's maybe a master or uh, you know a senior level position in your whatever your whatever your world is. Um, for me, like I personally learned so much more just sitting in studios, not getting paid or getting paid very, very, very little money. Um, but being able to observe and having my mind free to just focus on what masters were doing and then emulating that and being able to draw from those experiences, which is, I'm sure, what a lot of um, college kids are getting from great, great, uh, great professors. You know, you're able to hear somebody who has been successful in their field, who has been through pitfalls and learned how to navigate through, uh, you know, real world problems and things like that. Um, that I think is the the overall importance of of any educational experience is actually learning from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, in in the art industry specifically, like there are ways to get into it, but I've noticed uh, in my own path that there are essentially two different types of studios, and there are some that are run by people who only work with people who are educated, um, music school kids, or you know, there's specific colleges that kind of focus on studio and uh, studio learning and I've worked in those types of studios and it's, I've had great experiences with both. So I'm not necessarily saying one is better than the other, just kind of providing both experiences, but in the, the schools that are kind of pipelined, sorry, the studios that are pipelined out of schools. um, For instance, there's ocean way here in Nashville, uh, which works with uh, Belmont university and they have a program set up where kids just uh, come out of college and right into the studio. And it's an, it's an amazing experience. They have a shared vocabulary. They, you are 100% certain that whomever you're talking to is very knowledgeable about what they're talking about, which is as an artist or a producer working in that space, it's really uh, a vote of confidence. Like you can, you can do your work and know that whatever you're asking for um, is going to be taken care of properly by somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, So there's pros and cons to that. Then I've also worked in studios where specifically the owner will not hire anybody who's ever been to music school. It's a, it's a specific rule that they have. They don't want to deal with that type of mentality. Um, you know, that's their opinion, not mine, but there are some people who actually gatekeep their, their studios and won't let you in if you're educated, which I, I think it's silly to make any kind of rule like that in either direction, to be honest. Like I think there's value in, in all walks of life, especially, uh, in a collaborative and creative environment like a studio. But, um, I have seen it both ways and worked in both. I don't necessarily have a favorite. I, I've only been fortunate enough to work in the ones that don't require education for obvious reasons, because I'm a uneducated fellow myself. But, um, but the experience that I've had in both while different was, was great for both. So. Uh, may, may I ask a question? Did you say that they don't take people out of school? Yeah. So I've worked in a couple studios, um, that just specifically will not hire anybody who's ever been to a music school. And there is a very, um, I don't know how, if this is exactly the same as, you know, other 
more um, traditional schools, but music schools have a very specific method they teach, uh, especially when it comes to like engineering or production, you know, working on records. And um, I can speak a little bit as an artist. I personally am just kind of a very uh, easygoing person in my creative environment. So when I'm working, if I'm recording a song or something like that, I'm, I'm not really high strung, but I have worked with artists who are very, very much the opposite of that and who need everything to be a certain way. Um, and what I've, what I've learned from some, from some of these studio owners is uh, a lot of kids who go to go through the traditional music school path and learn, uh, kind of get molded how to work in studios. Um, maybe they have a specific way that they know how to do things, which is a good way, but it sometimes steps on the creativity of the artists or sometimes gets in the way of certain collaborative processes and some studio owners just don't want to deal with that. Um, like, like I said, it's not my personal belief. I, I think there's value in, in all sorts of stuff. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the record industry is split. There's like the, the Rick Rubin style production, right. Which is just kind of getting the, get a band in a room and turn on the microphones and you make a record and there's no technicality to it. It's just, you know, put the microphone here and we're going to sing a song and then see what happens. Uh, that, produces some great products sometimes sometimes it produces awful product and then the the alternative to that is the very calculated and very focused engineer based oh you put the microphone six inches or seven inches from the guitar you face it this way you reverse the polarity if it sounds and you know very different um ways of thinking of how to record music and i I don't think one is right or wrong necessarily but it seems to me uh, in the creative field like the studios tend to kind of pick one direction whether it's the more avant-garde um you know Brick Rubin style where we, we just make music and no one here necessarily technically knows how to engineer a record, but um, they still do it versus only music school kids where everything is very focused on, uh, you know, what the technically correct way to do, to do art is. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's education as values and disposition. And some people, you know, like the values and dispositions uh, learned in formal schooling and some people do not. I think a lot of people need to hear what what you just said, because there are two different paths to basically the same place. And you can pick the path that is conducive to, you know, your values and dispositions. So that's really cool. Yeah. And I think too many people get caught up in the in the sort of the war between the two where it's like, oh, it's only this and it's only this. And I mean, some of the greatest products that I've heard come out of multiple studios and some artists I think that are less structured value from the structured environment, right? Like some, you know, if you got a, a band that's just, you know, drinking all night and doing drugs all day, God bless them, but they might need somebody who's a little more structured to run the scenario for their recording. Like you can't just have a constant party going on and expect to, expect to come out with something great at the end. Although that does happen sometimes in the art world, the art world is kind of weird like that. But, and then on the alternative side, if you have a band that's, you know, very technically good at their at their instruments, and they're very you know focused on creating the best sounding thing that ever happened. You know, th- there might be a little um, benefit that they can get from having a less structured engineer or less less structured producer who just says, "Hey guys, you know, why don't we stop focusing on how many inches you know the guitar player stands from the bass player, and why don't we just you know talk about what the song was written about, or why don't we you know say a prayer together, whatever whatever it is to kind of get them in a more uh, free flowing creative state as opposed to strictly technical all day." Okay, Sheena, you wanna you wanna add in here? Yes, I was just gonna say that um, from my perspective, the price tag was worth it, right? I I underwent um, profound revelation <laughs> throughout my college uh, career, if we could call it that. Um, but I I I think a lot of the value for me came from being able to to build and be in community with, with people, especially professors, which then helped me through some of the darkest days. Like when I say, especially the closer I was to the traumas of my childhood, the more healing I still had to do. And I was very, very fortunate enough to, to be in classes with professors who, were extremely compassionate and very understanding and they saw something in me that I perhaps didn't see in myself and they befriended me, took me under their wings, you know, they helped me grow an immense 
um, in invaluable ways that extended so far beyond the knowledge that I learned from them. Because a lot, some of the knowledge I learned, um, since I'm speaking candidly, was really about recognizing the value of myself. You know, although I, I sort of, I had this unspoken understanding that everything was possible, that I was capable of everything. Um, because my life was set up in the way that it was, there were a lot of times where I needed to hear that from somebody, you know, and I needed to hear that from a sort of, um, a, a, a sort of an older mentor type figure. And so constantly, um, for better, or for worse, when I found myself really having a hard time, you know, not having family and things like that. Um, I had professors who were there for me in a lot of regards. And that, that to me is what made any student that I accumulated as an undergraduate really worth it. But I think for the average, you know, person, not necessarily so. Something that doesn't often get figured out until after the fact, right, is how student loan debt impacts your ability. Uh, it impacts your credit and then impacts your ability to, to get a house, for example. Um, and you don't necessarily know that until you're trying to get a house. And then all of a sudden you find out that, oh, yeah, you know, it, it, even if your payments are on time and stuff like that, your credit is is excellent. Your student to debt ratio is what lenders consider. So if you have X amount of student debt and you're in your starting salary and whatever position is after you finish college is X amount, if there's too big of a gap, according to their calculations, then you have to defer ambitions such as home ownership until you can get your student loan debt down enough, which is a t usually a time consuming process, right? Um and so I think I think I think there are some some cons that might outweigh the benefits, but it really just as has already been said and beating a dead horse, it really just depends on your goals and being aware of the different paths to the same goal, perhaps, and then uh, doing a sort of, you know, positive, negative scaling or analysis to figure out, okay, what's the best path for me to get to X goal? Okay. All right. So to me, it sounds like we're all pretty much in agreement that much of the questions I'm asking, the answer is like, it depends. Um, you know, one of the things I kind of wanted to bring up is, you know, this is anecdotal, but just, I've talked to certain people, obviously I didn't go to college, but people who have gone to college, I find that most of them are doing work that is not related to what they went to college for. Um, some of them are doing, uh, they're excelling at whatever new field that is unrelated to their degree. But then there's others who are definitely under, I don't know if it, underachieving in regards or in comparison to the degree that they went to. So for example, I had an ex-girlfriend who in the, you know, was working in retail for years and ended up uh, her, like her best job was basically a secretary and she had a master's. And also she came out with like over a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Um, and she had a full ride for her four years for her bachelor. So Part of me wonders, is there, are we lying to children before they enter school or are we, maybe lying is, is this too strong of a word because that, that puts like intent behind it, but are we blowing up what college is or could be for children before they enter school? Are we giving them this impression that just go to school, you'll come out and life will be grand and don't worry about the student loans? Um, are we not making them aware of how big of a, de of a decision this is? Um, because there, sometimes I talk to people, like I'll, I'll use my ex-girlfriend as an example. She was just like willfully unaware of what life would be like outside of school. 
you know, she, she was just like signing uh, paperwork to, to get her master's. The objective is to get the master's. It wasn't about anything else. She wasn't aware of how much her student loans would be uh, just from getting her master's. She was just doing it. You know, she was doing what she was told to do. You go to school, you get your education, you come out and you just deal with life. And, you know, if you did those particular steps, then you would have success. And, and I would watch how she was just completely upset at feeling like she was steered, either steered wrong or wasn't told the truth. You know, whether it be by her parents who, who just basically, you know, they were immigrants and they were just like get an education, uh, you know, damn everything else is get an education. And so she just went towards that path. Um, but I don't know, I, sometimes I wonder, is it parents who aren't being honest with their kids? Because I'm incredibly honest with my son um, about weighing his options, understanding this is a big decision. Um, do you want to delay going to college so you have a better understanding? You know, now he wants to, he, he actually wants to go to Japan and do animation. So his path is a little bit different than most kids in the United States. So, um, but that was his decision. That wasn't me trying to scare him away from college. But if he wanted to go to college in America, you know, I was completely honest with him, having him understand like how much it costs. Um, do you really want to do this? Do you want to work for a little bit before you go to school? that's perfectly fine for you to do. And I wonder if there's a level of honesty, whether it be from parents, um, high school administrators, um, uh, you know, whoever is influential in, in, in kids' lives before they enter college from letting them know how, how much of an undertaking this will actually be for them. And are we, are we blowing up college for kids um, that leaves them coming out completely disappointed, even if they had a good education, there aren't any jobs in whatever degree that they decide to go. You know, they were told to follow their passion, but not understand that there is no market for that particular degree. You know, so I, I always think about that. Um, anybody can jump in. Well, I mean, I, I'll say a couple of things. There, there's a lot you said there, and I want to touch on a, at least uh, some of the, you know, uh, more salient parts, I think, regarding my interest in this conversation. Um, when it comes to undergrad education, we should definitely be more transparent. But even if you don't end up doing what you majored in, if you went to a liberal uh, arts uh, college or even a university that abides by a liberal arts education, even if you don't do what you majored in, whatever you're doing, you know, is probably benefited from the general education requirements you had, right? Uh, liberal arts education is about breadth, not not necessarily depth. The major is about depth, but everything else is about knowing a little bit about everything. You know, so I'm sure the people may not be using their majors, but they're using their college education. Um, secondly, um, I think a lot of parents, when they say you got to go to college um, in order to you know have a happy and fulfilling life, um, that's part of what's been called credentialism these days. And basically what that is, is, you know, uh, most companies, most jobs require a piece of paper that you get when you go through four years of college and you got to go get that piece of paper if you want that job, you know, bottom line. It's not so much about, you know, um, you know, cultivating one's personality, one's character, one's uh, knowledge of the world and things like that. It's really a practical thing. So I, I get that as well. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that, you know, college is a waste of time if you don't do the major. But I do think we have an ethical responsibility to be as transparent as possible about what college is. When it comes to graduate school, we definitely have to do that. You know, so many people, I, you know, so many professors are like, yeah, go to go to graduate school. You'll go out, get a job, have a life like me. It's not like that. Um, getting the PhD is the easy part. You know, then you have to go through, you know, you got to find your space. You got to get a tenure track job. You got to get tenure. It's a haul. It's an odyssey. And we're not honest enough about graduate education for sure. And that needs to be remedied. 
But um, there, there's benefit to going to college, even if you don't use your major. Okay. Sheena? You see, I keep throwing up um, <laughs> the 100 symbol in agreement with Eric. Um, so I don't have anything really valuable to add because I feel like he already said it. So. Sorry. I would say, uh, I mean, I, I am also like in, in agreement with everything that you're saying. Uh, I just want to touch on one thing that, that Dr. Sheena had said um, regarding home ownership, which I find so interesting because, um, you know, not necessarily from my own path, but from, from having friends who've gone down the traditional collegiate path and, and incurred quite a bit of debt, I do see that it's really delaying our path to home ownership, which I personally think is ex an extremely valuable thing. I mean, I, having been through homelessness myself and then um, being on the other side of it now and actually, you know, being able to own a home, I'm super grateful. And I've had my own financial pitfalls and things like that throughout, throughout the way, but I can't, can't stress enough, like how important financial literacy is. And it's, it's a shame that it's not taught earlier or sometimes at all in the high school experience, or I, I can't speak to the undergrad experience because I, I haven't been through it, but um, I didn't learn most of the things that I know, um, on the financial literacy, literacy side until I started hanging out around people who had been successful and most of them, and this is probably just a, a product of, of my specific environment, but most of the people in the music space that I, uh, that I know that were successful enough to own a home had not been to college also. So all of us were kind of in a similar boat where we, we had to kind of find that information ourselves. And now that I'm more aware of of how that process works. Um, like Dr. Sheena was saying with debt to income ratios and um, specifically with uh, college loans, not being forgivable and constantly being on your weighing down on your, um, your debt to income ratio. I think it's extremely important to make that information very available to kids before they make the decision uh, and to their parents. I mean, some parents don't even know this stuff, but and you don't find it out until you're, you know, a hundred thousand in debt or 40,000 in debt. And, not, it's not even necessarily the debt that weighs you down, but the the delaying of your path to homeownership, which is essentially a, a path towards, you know, some financial freedom, um, building assets and things like that. That's that's such an important part of of growing your wealth and growing your family. And um, I feel like kids are just thrown under the bus, like you know, preyed upon, especially in kind of small towns. I come from a small town in Ohio myself, and just kind of seeing like you're saying, Oh, everybody needs to go to college. And that's kind of the mentality, which I know everybody who says that is good hearted in nature. It's not, you know, no one's doing it to be predatory, but unfortunately a lot of these universities have gotten involved in, and I don't want to paint with too broad of a stroke, but a lot of, a lot of what college has become is a financial grift, which is unfortunate because the educational aspect of it is so important and should be focused on. And I don't want, you know, to, my words to be conflated is to be speaking against college itself. But I do think that the financial side of it is just totally, become this unfortunate, you know, predatory beast um, that's kind of gotten out of control. And so you're seeing kids now, they don't know what they're doing. They sign up for these loans at 18 years old. And by the time they're 24, not only are they in debt, but now they've delayed their pathway to homeownership possibly forever. I mean, if you're looking at somebody who's 24 paying that stuff off until they're 40, you know, when they finally get to the point where they can afford to get to a home, they've now missed out on 16, you know, 10 to 10 to 15 years, let's call it, of growing what can be your most valuable asset in home ownership, you know, and that's when you study housing markets and really look at like how general way, generational wealth is built. That's one of the, one of the few ways to, to build it. Um, and if kids just knew that and took even a year off after high school and, you know, you can go work whatever job and put some money aside while living with your parents for your first down payment and get yourself in through an FHA program and actually, start building your wealth first and then incur a bunch of college debt, you'd be, in my opinion, significantly more well off and way further ahead than a lot of kids who are just diving right into it. That's why actually a lot of my friends who are in the military have, are in a great boat because they, they put in their four years and now they're in a situation where college is paid for and they can get a VA loan, which on the, as far as building generational wealth, generational wealth, again, like that, that is just a significantly better boat to be in than to be in a situation where your debt to income ratio is, you know, essentially a hundred percent, which is, it's rough. That's a good point. Um, I'm going to take this time to remind everybody who's listening that we record um, this show basically every week, 7.30 PM Eastern standard. 
um, with different topics, different people. Um, basically, I have questions for people about a variety of different topics. So um, make sure you, you come in next week. I believe next week we'll be talking about the benefits of homeschooling. I know a lot of people have questions about homeschooling. Uh, you know, some of it stems from, you know, CRT and, and th that whole debate. So um, we'll be having some great guests next week. So uh, make sure you you tune in onto Spaces then. Um, also, I'll be opening up the floor uh, in just a moment. So if you have a question, um, you know, you can put in a request to speak. My only, uh, the only thing I will say is, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who want to speak. So make sure you, you know, kind of get straight to your point. I'll let you say your piece. We'll comment on it. And uh, we'll just have a nice cordial conversation based off of that. Um, I, I do have a question. It's sorry, Jake, but it's more so directed towards Eric and Sheena because they are college professors. What is the one thing that you see from college students that they are, uh, that you wish that they knew before entering college? Um, time management skills, right? Um, it, there's a lot going on in college, especially when you're a freshman and you're on your own. Your parents aren't there to, you know, help you with that discipline. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find the time to get everything done and have a life. I mean, you, you figure it out. Everybody figures it out eventually. But uh, that's the skill that they're like, oh, my God, I need a class in this. I need a class in time management. Um, so I would say that. Okay, Sheena. <laughs> so um, kind of going back and forth on figuring out how, how to say this, but I think because it's, it's going to come across as sort of counterintuitive, but um, the mantra that my students pick up from me and take with them everywhere is question everything. But it seems to be the case, uh, increasingly so, that when I, by the time I meet with my students and I'm teaching them anything, they are they, whether it's a sort of self policing or something like that, or just a, uh, having ideas about the world that that they aren't encouraged to interrogate or question and see are these ideas true um and as much as an idea can be true i think that's the thing that um, my students take away from me that i encourage not just my students but any person who will listen um to adopt is the practice of really questioning everything and um you know i i say that it's it's kind of disheartening because by the time I'm meeting most of my students for most of my courses, they're seniors, you know, it's the end of the road. And then we kind of discover together what ideas they have that aren't true. And it, it has, I, I have heard from students um, that they often figure out how the game works in the classroom. So they end up saying what they think the professor wants to hear as opposed to what they think. Not always, but often enough for it to be um, concerning and something that I have to help students and encourage them to unlearn. Uh, because ultimately, if that's how they're moving and that's how they're seeing themselves in the classroom space, and if we are sincere in our belief that college is supposed to be educational, <laughs> meaning... Um, that's where people learn, right? That's where they test their ideas and test their knowledge and expand their knowledge. Then that is 100% something I wish students came into my classroom already asserting and um, privileging is this, this always questioning everything. Mm. That speaks to me because that's like, that's been my mantra for like the past well, I've been questioning a lot of things most of my life, but especially like the past few years with everything going on. Um, and, and actually that's one of the things I tell my son. I say, question everything, even me. Uh, you know, you, you should be allowed to, to critique anything in life, any person, no matter their stature, how close they are. Uh, and, you know, like, like you said, you know, you're a professor, they should be able to question you. 
Um, so I think that's, that's a very healthy thing for people to do. Um, so I commend you for, for telling kids that. And uh, Eric, yes, time management for sure. I can, I can definitely see that. That's one of the reasons I didn't go to college because I knew I just, I, I felt like I wasn't going to be ready for that. Um, I'm still to this day, not that organized. Uh, and, and my wife is the one who is far more organized and helps me out. So um, thank God for her. Um, so I, I will open up the floor to Yams, if that's your real name. I go by no uh, I go by yams. <laughs> um, but I wanted to um, ask professors um, just quickly, I wanted to share um, like Adam, you mentioned that you had had a girlfriend who was the child of immigrants. Um, I my family and me, we came here as immigrants. And I definitely think there's something to the fact that, you know, Americans um, the American degree is very much like in many countries, you it's very prestigious. And so immigrant parents, they don't know anything usually about money. They don't know usually much about wealth. And then they just tell the kids, oh, go get an American degree. So I graduated with um, about $55,000 in debt. I had a full ride, but I didn't have any um, parental support because we were um, homeless. And so anyways, I am in my 20s. I finished paying all of my debt uh, just a few years ago, uh, months ago, actually. Um, and um, but the thing that I came away with feeling was that it actually wasn't worth it at all. And um, so I work at a big tech company, um, which is how I was able to pay it off. <laughs> and um, my partner of 10 years, we actually met in our first year of university. Um, also, he uh, actually dropped out of the university that we met at. Um, and so anyways, we both have a very low opinion, I think, of, of university. I hate to say that. I know that sounds terrible. Um, but anyways, I something that I really, really wished after looking back on everything, um, sometimes I wish that my professor had like sat us down, any one of them, just one, and said, listen, like this field that you're studying is very difficult and it's hard even to get a job as a professor. It's hard to be in this industry. It's very small. Your you know, opportunities are low, you know, or they're very tight. So, I mean let's be real about this. Let's be honest. I wish that they had just told me somebody, anybody, um, because I think when I got to my senior year or junior year, I started to become extremely scared. And that's when I started to um, pursue like a lot of different interests that I had. So anyways, what I'm trying to say, ask about and inquire about to the professors is like, um, it may not be your guys' role because you're not advisors, right? You're just professors. But are there ever times that you wish that you could sit down with your students and tell them the maybe if there is difficulty in the industry you're in, do you wish that you could tell them that? Are there things that you don't feel you can be honest about um, and these sorts of things? I'm really curious about the professor's experience because sometimes I actually look back and feel resentful of them. I wish they had said something. Okay. And, and um, well, I'm sorry. No, I know. Okay. Um, yeah. So. So I'm, I'm also an advisor. I, I'm a professor primarily, but I do advise students. And, you know, I, when it comes to like generally graduating and going out into the workforce and things like that, I'm not, I, I don't do this whole warning speech. If they want to go to graduate school, I do. Uh, definitely. And I'm like, okay, listen, it's not as glorious as it looks. All right. Um, especially because you're going to get out of uh graduate school with a master's or a PhD and $10 trillion in debt. And you're not going to get that prestigious job right away. You're going to work at, you know, community colleges. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not really the goal of most people getting a PhD or even a master's. It's a long haul. So I warn them about that, you know, and I, I try to be as optimistic as possible. You know, I say something to, to the effect of, um, I know you can do it but I make sure you want to do it. I'm going to tell you what you can expect. And uh, it's not the happiest, shiniest picture I paint. So I try to be as transparent as possible with them uh, regarding that. 
Yeah, so like Eric, I also am in the position to start advising students, though this is my first semester as an assistant professor. So um, so I don't have any students that I'm advising yet, but I've been teaching for a long time, and I would like to think that I would take a similar approach to what Eric is suggesting. I think mindset is extremely vital and, and critical and important, and um and I guess because I believe wholeheartedly as I've lived and witnessed the transformative power of education that um, while it might be hard to get the exact job somebody's looking for or something like that, I, I personally don't believe that it's ever a waste of time, that any amount of education is ever a waste of time or um, which isn't to say that I agree that or think that we should be having a whole bunch of debt like that there are downsides which i i mentioned at the outset of this conversation um but i guess because i do tend to have this strong belief that everything is possible and yada 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 i i don't know i i think it there's a a distinction my brain is making between giving this sort of advice that you said that you wish that you had versus being more balanced and also st- but also still being very encouraging uh, because I think ultimately um, people have to learn and figure out for themselves their own paths. And I am more the like, follow your dreams. If this is your aspiration, I'm not going to be the one to tell you otherwise because I've had people try to do that to me and it was demoralizing right it was actually not helpful it was the exact opposite of that and it made me feel unseen because I'm like no but this is what I really want and this is what I value and this is why I value it so I don't know I I, it's like somehow there's a there will have to be a balance for me between giving people a better understanding, especially if they're talking about grad school. I think Eric is spot on with that. Um, But I think in other circumstances, just, you know, undergrads looking at the workforce afterwards or something. I mean, what, what is it that I'm going to say that's going to actually be helpful? They're already in school. I'm not going to talk them out of not being in school. I'm not going to talk them out of changing their major because who am I to, to, to make such suggestions, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yes, I'm not sure if that, hopefully that helps you. I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting perspective to hear from their side. Um, I would imagine if I was a professor and a student is in front of me, they're in their junior, senior year, it's, a, it's difficult to kind of burst someone's bubble or is it even a bubble to be burst? You know, they're not your they're not your parents. You know, they're your professor. Hopefully, you have some sort of cordial relationship with them. But um, outside of college, it's difficult to to tell someone something who is set on a particular trajectory in life that hey, uh, maybe you can't do this, or hey, this might be more difficult than you think it is. You know, so it's. I understand where you you're coming from. It's kind of like hindsight is 2020 uh, and you're going back and you're like, Oh, I wish someone told me this, but the reality is what if someone did tell you that, would you be accepting of it? Would you be like, how dare they tell me that this is too hard? Why are they telling me this? Why don't they believe in me? You see what I'm saying? So it's a lot easier to think that if someone told you the truth years ago that you would have accepted it. Um, Cause a lot of times, a lot of people aren't ready for the truth, um, you know, especially if it's uncomfortable. Well, I don't I don't tell them, you know, uh, I don't think you can do it. Um, I, I tell them, you know, you may not want to do it once you realize what it is. You know, so right. I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you I'm going to be as transparent as possible. Tell you what it is. If you still want to go. Good luck. You have my email. <laughs> You know, uh, contact me if you need some advice or a shoulder to cry on or something like that. Uh, but but there it is. Yeah. Yeah. My um, I got you know, I definitely had 
very clear insight into what grad school was and then what the job market was after that uh, before doing any of it. And I was grateful to have a realistic expectation for what was to come. Okay. Well, Yams, thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Kat here in a second. Jake, I'm sorry. I know you're not a professor. We didn't involve you on this one. Don't be. I'm, uh, I'm proud to me- represent the Midwits, and I'm grateful to be learning, <laughs> <laughs> learning from some great professors. So I'm just glad to be here. All right. Uh, Kat. You can unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. I had to figure that one out. I've never done this before. <laughs> it's all good. Hi, Eric. How are you? Eric was kind enough to come on my YouTube channel one time. Um, Hello. How are you? Good to see you. I'm great. Uh, so is college important? Um, I, I agree with most of what everybody said. It depends on the individual. I always had this perspective that like most, not all, because there are some very driven, astute 18 year olds out there that just know that, you know, this is what they do and go for it. But I've always had this idea that, you know, a lot of kids when they graduate high school, you know, they, everybody tells them you should go to college, you should get a degree, but most 18 year olds don't have a clue as to who they are. And I think Jake touched on this a bit, like get to know yourself a little bit, get a job, you know, go out in the world, figure out who you are um, and what you might want to do. Um, when I was little, I wanted to be an English teacher because I loved writing. Um, but when I got older and I actually enrolled in college, you know, I was a good student, but I didn't have a clue as to what I wanted to do. And then I finally went to school for cosmetology and now I'm a cosmetology educator and I love my job. So I went to a technical school. My husband is a skilled tradesman. He's a carpenter and a painter and does very well for himself. He owns his own business. So I really just think it depends on the individual. (laughs) That's pretty much my take on it. I wouldn't say it's not important because it's given us people like Eric Smith and, you know, many others that I admire and listen to, but it wasn't important for us. And it's it's not important for a lot of people. You know, like I said earlier, there are, you know, kids uh, coming out of high school who know what they want to do. It has nothing to do with college and they do it. And they have pretty good lives. And I, I, I see them. I know some of them. And I'm like, it, it took me decades to make the money you're making, you know? But I did, you know, I chose this because it's what I wanted to do. It's definitely a lifestyle uh, distinct from most others. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's, I won't say that college isn't for everybody. Um, college isn't necessary for everybody. Yes. And the stigma of not having a college degree needs to go away. I couldn't agree more. Okay. That's all I had to add. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. We got a lot of people request, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move quickly here. We're gonna go to Steve. Good to see you, you guys again. Um, I think the the biggest issue for me is, you know, being in in, an autodidactic and, oh, I didn't even realize Christian's in here. Christian, how you doing? Um, Is, you know, I I started reading a couple of years ago and I I read and listen to a ridiculous amount of books, you know, probably around 150 to 200 a year. And the amount of time that I've spent watching YouTube channels, um, especially Christian, would probably make him feel uncomfortable. (laughs) But you know, the, the thing that, that I, I didn't go to college and now that I've decided in my forties that I want to start learning things and reading things, <laughs> you know, um, I find that the thing I'm missing out on is the ability to speak to someone like a professor. Um, thankfully I have, you know, Dr. Sheena and, you know, in, in my life quite a bit and I can ask her questions, but for the most part, it's, it's, it just seems like there's something lacking from my own autodidactic learning experience where there's i just i just i know there's more questions and i have no one to ask them to in the specific fields that you know that i'm reading in like i read a lot of philosophy right now i'm reading michael polani um personal knowledge and and i'm reading uh, elaine Locke and and a whole bunch of different books probably four or five right now 
and and I find that I don't really have, you know, there's there's always questions that you just can't ask, and I and it seems to me that part of that college experience is being able to ask your professor questions that I couldn't ask and, you know, trying to search YouTube videos for that specific answer to that specific question is intensely, you know, difficult to the point where you almost give up. Um, but you just, you keep reading and you keep trying to understand and you keep, you know, you, you get involved in, you know, things like this and, um, you know, it, it just seems like there's something missing that there is more to, what I'm reading and I just don't have access to it. Um, so I, I hope that, I hope that's concise enough. Anybody can jump in, feel free. Yeah, I can say something a little about that. I mean, I, cause I do kind of feel what you're saying um, again, coming from the autodidactic side and just being, you know, curious about things and drawn to learning even about topics that I'm not necessarily fully passionate about. If I'm going to, when I learn about something new, I just like to dive in and, and read a book about it or a chapter about it or a paragraph, whatever I can find about it. Um, and I do find that that community aspect of educate of institutional education uh, is appealing to me. Yeah. Having not been a part of it, you know, maybe I'm romanticizing it a little bit, but it, it does. Um, I do see like a huge benefit in being able to read something or learn something uh even if it's on my own and then go to a place and actually discuss it with other people who have just learned it. I'm sure there's uh, ways to dodge um, certain pitfalls and ways to kind of um, collapse the, the timeline of learning through each other's um, experiences and making that process easier and uh, yeah, just all around better by doing it with a group. Like I love reading on my own. I love learning things on my own through YouTube channels and, and I've been fortunate to, you know, like I said, being at being a time when that's fully uh, there's no more gatekeepers in the educational world on the internet, but you still do miss that community aspect, which I'm sure the professors can can attest. There's probably a a really big upside to being able to have those discussions and being able to kind of navigate that pathway with other people who are in a similar boat, as opposed to just kind of diving in on your own. Well, yeah, I wish I wish you could just I wish someone like me could just go to a college and sit in a class and listen to the class and just talk to the professor or the, or the, or the teacher or whoever, and just ask them questions. But, you know, I, it doesn't feel like there's access to that. So when you said gatekeeping, that kind of perked my ears up and it, it does, it kind of seems like it's, you know, all throughout, you know, K through 12, 12, you're learning what they want you to learn. But when you finally get to learn what you want to learn, you don't have anybody there to, to ask questions about and to teach you what you want to learn out of the material. Yeah, Dr. Sheena actually made a great point about that um, that I, I meant to touch on also regarding questioning everything. And I, I find it interesting because that's something that I, I, you know, not to be combative, but always have always done. I've always been a kind of a questioner of things. And I found that, uh, and this could have been, you know, just anecdotal, my school experience specifically, but for me around the ninth or 10th grade, that, that started being frowned upon and sort of shunned, um, which turned me off from the collegiate experience, which, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure if my life would have been better or worse necessarily if I would have gone to college. I'm not here to debate that, but it definitely prevented me from going down that pathway, which, um, you know, is, is a good pathway. Like I said, I do see a lot of value in college, but for me personally, I was kind of turned off by high school level educators who taught me, uh, most of which taught me to not question everything and try to kind of get me to subscribe to a certain, um, you know, way of thinking. I think Eric called it preferred discourse, um, and that made total sense. Like they're trying to, and, and I, I do see the benefit to it. There is a reason that they're doing that to kind of prep you to be a part of the college experience. So I'm sure there is a method to the madness, but for me on a personal level, I was kind of turned off from higher education simply because what I thought it was going to be is not what it actually ended up being. You know, I, I thought it was going to be a more conformist, um, you know, type of situation. And, and now that I'm older and I'm, uh, a little less ignorant, not fully less ignorant, but a little less. Uh, I do see that there's this great community aspect to college where there's a huge benefit to actually learning with other people who are there and who are paying money to learn because, you know, that does seem like a good experience to me. But again, I'm on the outside looking in, so I'm sure the, the professors can speak to that more than I can. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I understand that aspect of being discouraged to ask questions. 
Uh, some people just want to dictate. They don't want you to, to challenge. So I, I can definitely understand why that, that discouraged you from, from moving forward. Um, Steve, thank you. Thank you for contributing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. No problem. Uh, Chanel, you can, did I say your name right? Chanel, yeah. Chanel, Chanel. yeah. Um, okay. Hi, from Trinidad. So I think university is important for exactly the reason that Steve just raised, in that you get the real-time feedback of a professor as well as your colleagues, and I really valued that in my experience. Um, my question, however, is as regards the marketing aspect of it, because women have a biological clock, men do not. And I think a lot of the time, like being a career woman is pushed on women a lot and they tend to lose out on the opportunity sometimes of having children or having to postpone that experience. So do you think that there should be a different marketing strategy towards women because of that? Or how useful do you think that would be? That's my question. Uh, Eric, do you have anything? Well, I I need her to to ask that question again because she was she was cutting out for me. Okay, um, let me rephrase. The women have a biological clock, and men do not, and. From where I'm standing, I think that a lot of the times being a career woman is pushed onto girls and women, and it is often at the expense of them starting families and whatnot. So do you think that there ought to be a different marketing strategy towards women versus men in terms of college enrollment? Um, wow. Well. Um, well, let me start off by saying that um, you know, I probably won't give the best answer here, but you know, when it comes to college, you know, uh, eighteen to twenty-two, um, most people, uh, you know, who want to go to college know that they're going to have to, you know, start being a parent or something like that afterwards. The issue with the biological clock and things like that often comes in graduate school or even after graduate school, when you're trying to establish yourself as a professor. And things need to be built into the institution that can be conducive to people who want to start families. Uh, some schools are better than others with that. So I, I guess you just have to, you know, luck out and hope that you find a, an institution where, you know, they are empathetic, you know, to your desire to, you know, take some time off to start a family. That's my uninformed answer. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Sheena, do you have anything to add? I would love to, except when Chanel started talking, everything froze and I couldn't hear anything, so I had to leave and come back. So I didn't. I heard Eric's response, but not the question. Okay, um, could somebody rephrase it for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess ultimately she's asking. Could there be a better marketing strategy for women um, who do want to start families um, and don't have to completely forego going to college? I think that's essentially the question. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, a better marketing strategy. I'm. I'm based on that articulation of the question, I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give my two cents. So I think probably one of the, the benefits for someone who, who does want to continue down that path, maybe to marriage and kids, um, let's say early on, like in their early 20s, um, mm -hmm. but they're unable to go to a class uh, you know, regularly during the week, uh, the, a good alternative is online. Um, now we have online schooling. You have family. You have kids. It uh, doesn't even matter the age anymore, really. You can get some sort of education from it. Um, as In regards to is it better or worse, 
then in person, I think that's up to the individual. Um, but at least you can get some formal education by by using online schooling. So um, I think that is an alternative. And actually, uh, there are certain colleges that have been targeting women uh, by enticing them with certain programs, especially the social science pro- programs. Um, they've been keying in on certain demographics, um, specifically women. So it is it does exist. Um, one thing I will say is in some of those cases, even though it's online, it's just as expensive as going into the classroom. So um, that could be something to, to be a bit of a drawback, but it's something to consider. All of this is happening while I'm changing one of my two-year-old triplets. So um, I actually did my, finished my doctoral program dissertation, all of that, uh, pregnant with triplets and then having triplets. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible. And I guess that's also lending to my, um, hesitancy in, in how to answer. Cause I'm not sure what's really being asked. And the, the other thing I'll say is too, most, well, maybe most isn't the right word, but a lot of colleges have daycares for students and faculty. I know mine, mine does anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see family making or anything of that nature as being an obstacle anymore. I, I personally just don't see it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. I, I do have to get going soon. So I just yeah. wanted to let you know if you that. Gotta, if you got to jump off, uh, it's perfectly fine. All right. Well, I, I enjoyed this. Thank you, Adam, for putting it together. And um, yeah, the rest of you, the rest of this wonderful panel, have a great night. And all the listeners, thanks for coming. I'll see Thank you later. You, great to meet you, Eric. Bye, Eric. Um, Do we have anybody else who wanted to ask a question? Uh, it doesn't look like it. So... I will give my my final uh, my final words here. First, I want to thank uh, the panel. I, I really appreciate. Oh, wait, before I go, Christian, Christian will be our our final uh, our final speaker here. Hello, you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, this has been a good talk. Um, you know, as someone who is about to graduate college and what. A week, actually. Yeah, a week. You know, I'm graduating early, actually, um, because of the work I did in high school. they giving me credits and everything. So I'm actually very happy about that. <laughs> um, you know, if I had to choose whether to go back to college again, I wouldn't do it. Um, and let me just walk you through my thought. I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to walk you through my, th- my, thought, my thought process. My thought process was this. If you don't get a college degree your income on average will be lower than someone who does have a college degree. Now, what that statistic or what people who cite that stat don't include is that your income to debt ratio will probably be much lower than that person, which basically means that you have the capability of creating more wealth than someone who has a lot more debt than you do. So I would rather actually make $70,000 a year as a waiter and have no debt than make Twenty thousand or, or thirty thousand dollars a year as a grad or as as whatever fill in the job and have about fifty thousand dollars in debt because my ability to create wealth is very limited um, just given my debt or it's it's it's, it's handicapped. Um, but anyway, so that stat misled me, and I kind of misled me too because I had the idea that I was going to go be a lawyer, and I'll echo the sentiments of people earlier in the chat. Well, no one, no 18, uh, very few 18 year olds know what they actually want to do. It took me till I was 19 to realize that I wanted to become a political commentator and or public intellectual. It took me till I was 20 to figure out a way how to do that because some public intellectuals go through academia. Um, Some public intellectuals um, go through law school. Some go into the medical field and go write for someone. And I decided, you know what, if I had really figured all this out, before I had gotten into this big process, I wouldn't have needed to go to college in the first place because almost everyone in the political commentary and political media, whether it's Sean Hannity, whether it's Candace Owens, 
they are college dropouts or high school graduates. So, you know, I think there's an information problem. There's a serious information problem that a lot of people um, we should deal with. And there's also a problem that a lot of kids are not living for themselves. And this is an anecdote here, but a lot of people that I've talked to or in college um, say I'm here because my parents and my family want me to be here. And to be honest with you, uh, the question isn't really as college important, even though that's a very important question. The question is the antecedent to that question, which is, is college important for me? Is college important for my life? And when you are just coming out of high school and you're still under the financial thumb, as many 18-year-olds are, of their family, that is, your ability to answer that question becomes very complicated, immensely complicated. So, in short, I just I, I think that you know the old maxim Socrates, Socrates said, uh, "Know thyself." That's what people should prioritize before they even begin considering the uh, the college question. But there's a lot of social pressures that make it very hard for an 18 year old coming out of high school to even consider that stuff in the first place. So that's my take. Um, and I, this has been a great conversation and I appreciate all of you for having it. Thank you, Christian. Sheena, do you wanna, you wanna add anything? <laughs> no, I probably should have left a while ago cause I am wrangling my two year olds. Um, but yeah, I feel like everything that could have been said has been said. So I've enjoyed having this conversation. Glad to make some new connections. Um, love and light to everyone and also happy holidays. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. I know you're busy. So um, thank you again. And uh, Christian, thank you um, for giving you two cents. Actually, I'm going to end with Christian here. Um, I'm going to give my, my final two cents before we end this session. Um, and it has a, lo a little bit to do with what Christian said as far as 18-year-olds um, not really understanding what to do for themselves for the rest of their lives. Um, I'll, this is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a story, but uh, I, I started traveling throughout Europe uh, a few years ago. And I remember coming across a group of young women and they look like they're in their mid twenties, but they were telling me that they were college students. And so I would just verify with them, they were 25, 26 and they're in college. And I was like, man, that seems kind of late in comparison to what we do. And there are various reasons as to why, but it, throughout Europe, the, the way they approach uh, college is a little bit different than what we do. Um, they have apprenticeship programs. Um, they may try a variety of programs to try and see, is this something that I actually want to do for the rest of my life? Um, they also have uh, programs where they can travel abroad um, for periods of time throughout the world and continue their education. They're very laissez-faire, at least this particular generation, about their schooling. Some of them are straight through, some of them are very laissez-faire about their education, but they have this very flexible and, and prolonged period of actually getting their education. Um, and some of them are able to work in between. So they're able to gain some sort of life experience. Granted, part of the reason they're able to, you know, some of them I met with Germans, uh, it is something that's paid for through taxes. So uh, it's hard to live that particular life when you have 60 to $80,000 worth of debt riding over your head. Um, so I'm fully aware of the financial ramifications of trying to do that here. Um, but I do think that there is value for children who are coming uh, into their adulthood and choosing to work, choosing to delay education. Uh, I think there's this false notion that, you know, if the kid doesn't go to college right away, they're going to become a bum. Well, they only become a bomb if you allow them to, if, you know, if they're your kid. Um, if you're staying under my roof, you're working, you're doing something, you're doing something productive. So, but there is value in getting some sort of job, uh, apprenticeship, mentorship, um, but to do something to, to put themselves in a position where they're really able to figure out, is this cr the correct path for me? Because I think what ends up happening is the kids are going through K through 12. Every year is about 
what their teacher wants, what their teacher wants. And they never really have that time to figure out what do I actually want, right? You know, they say, I want to go to this school. Well, why do you want to go to school? Well, they have this program. Okay, but what do you actually want? Um, not what profession you want to be because it fills this, uh, this, this expectation of someone else or anything. So I think taking a year or two break after high school, working, uh, meeting people, even traveling, um, can really help a young person to, to figure out what they want to do for themselves um, before taking that big financial leap into college. So I think if there was anything that I would advocate for, it's for any parents who have teenagers, be cognizant that this is, this is a big step for them. And not every kid is built to go to college. Even to this day, I'm not built to go to college. I know that about myself, but it, it took for me to act upon my insecurities about college to not do it, but to choose a different path. And thankfully it worked out in the long run. But there are kids who felt just like me who were pressured by their, their parents to go into college just to get something. Um, and, and they mull around and maybe they fail or and they fail and they still have this debt and so I, I think as parents, we should be more mindful of that. That is a big decision. And most 18 year olds have zero idea what they want to do. They're probably going to change their mind years later. Um, and so giving them time to breathe and figure the life out, I think could be extremely beneficial. So um, that's my two cents. I want to thank Jake for coming on here, uh, Eric Smith, Sheena Mason. I really appreciate them coming on and everybody for sticking in and listening to us have this conversation. Uh, tune in next week, 7.30, Wednesday. Uh, we'll be talking about, I believe it's the benefits of homeschooling uh, with some great guests. So thank you again for sticking in. And uh, we will be posting this as a replay in case you missed anything. Uh, we'll be posting on YouTube uh, in the upcoming weeks. So keep an eye out for that. And um, long and short, have a great evening. And thank you again. Thanks, Adam. Have a good one. You too.